So anyways, glad everyone's here tonight. Totally glad. Tonight we're going to be talking about a battle for our identity. Okay, a battle for our identity. So I'm going to ask a few questions. Okay, so don't like throw answers at me, but just consider the questions, okay, that I ask. Um, let's start. Lord, let me just pray before we start. Holy Spirit, we thank you for being here, Lord. Jesus, you dropped this inside of me, so just help me to deliver it, Lord, as you want it to be delivered, Lord. Let these be your words, and have open hearts, Jesus, ready to accept these words, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, so I'm just going to ask some questions, okay? So don't shoot out answers, but just consider them for yourself. You know, um, first question, who, who, who are you? Really, who are you? Who, you know, how, how do you define yourself? How would you define yourself? Who or what defines you? You know, the number of likes you get, which is a, a new phenomenon, you know, in our society nowadays. 20 years ago, uh, when I was in university, I was like, likes, what does that mean? You know, number of likes you get. Maybe your friends, wh what, what defines you is what I'm asking. Is it your friends, maybe your friend group, your family? When you look in the mirror, are you happy with what you see? There's a question, right? Are <laughs> you looking? Are you have? How do you how do you define or consider yourself? Do you think of yourself as smart, handsome, pretty, witty, capable, smart? You know, like how do you consider yourself? Nowadays, you know, like I said, there's so many things influencing us. There's social media. Social media is huge. Social media has come against us. It's helped us for sure, but it's certainly come against us in so many ways as well because it is so incredibly addictive, right? We have all admit that. Our friends also influence us, I would say. Maybe, maybe the groups that you belong to, the clubs or groups that you belong to, trends influence us as well, right? Culture influences us, us and, 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 and even clubs will influence us. So different things influence us and will cause us to define ourselves in a certain way. And why am I asking these questions? I'm asking them because I believe that how we view ourselves, right, um, um, who we consider ourselves to be matters, right? You guys agree with that? Like it totally matters, right? It matters. So... Um, why? Why is it that how we uh, view ourselves matters? Why is it that how we carry ourselves matters? Why is that? Because it affects how we act, right? What, how, what we feel and think about ourselves, you know, how confident we are and all those kinds of things affect how we carry ourselves. Does that make sense? It totally does, right? Are we carrying ourselves in a, in a way that we're bold all the time? Are we shy? Are we prideful? Are we... Are we approachable? Are we unapproachable? All of those things come from kind of how we define ourselves and how we carry ourselves, right? So guys, what I'm saying is, um, whether you're an unbeliever or a believer, and when I say believer, I mean somebody who's opened their hearts and invited Jesus to come in, there's a battle, there's a fight for how we define ourselves because there's so many things coming at us trying to tell us that we should be this way or we should be that way or we should be this way. There's a battle for our identity. There really is. Listen to this, listen to this. As believers, okay, listen to this truth. As believers in Jesus Christ, and I'm a pastor, right, so I, I'm addressing you guys as such. As believers in Jesus Christ, one of the greatest battles we, we, we will have, myself included, and everybody will have this as a believer, one of the greatest battles we will have, one of the greatest battles we will face as believers, as people who have invited Jesus into our hearts, is realizing who we are in Christ and holding on to our true identity of who God has called and defined us to be. Why is that? That's the question I'm really asking to you. Why is it that we can't just, um, you know, uh, 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 God tells us who we are, we just grab it and run with it? Why? Why is there a battle for our identity? That's really a question that I'm asking. Somebody throw me an answer. Why is there a battle? Why can't, why can't God just tell us something about ourselves and we just grab onto it and just walk with it? Why not? Don't all the answers come flying at me at once. <laughs> come on, God. 
Why? I have an answer, so if nobody else does, praise God for me. I certainly will. I certainly will. There's a battle for our identity. One of the reasons we cannot, we, we don't just take what God has told us and run with it and believe. And we're gonna, I'm going to ask you some of the things that God calls us in a minute. It's because God is not the only voice speaking to us. There's another voice speaking as well. God speaks to us, but the enemy is speaking also. And he's not building us up. He's not agreeing with God. Right? He's called um, the accuser of the brethren in the scripture. Right? He opposes us. He lies to us. And he tries to tell us who God. So God tells us one thing and he says, that's not true. That's not true. He literally tells us the opposite of one sense. And listen to me. It's constant. Remember, the, anybody ever see the cartoon where there's a cartoon and there's one little voice over here, maybe the shape of a demon, and one little voice over here, maybe the, anybody ever see that on, on, on TV? And it's, it's, well, I don't, it's not a little demon looking like that, but it's the truth. There's two voices coming at us all the time, all the time. And you know what? The enemy never says, you know what? Next Tuesday, guys, back off. Just leave them alone. Let them just hear what God has to say. If they read the word, let the word just go into them. Don't, don't mess with them. The enemy never gives us a day off. He is constant, constant, constant. He never stops. He never stops. Someone tell me some of the ways that God defines us. Tell me some of the things that God says about us, who we are. Guys. Yes, Naomi. We're beautiful. Amen. Amen. Somebody else. Come, come, come. We've talked about this. Go ahead. We're the children of God. Amen. Sorry. Somebody else. Something else. We're made in the image of God. Amen. 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 Right? So God is telling us these things. And if you crack open the word and read it, it's going to tell you who you are. Right? And the enemy's also talking to us all the time also. All the time also. Somebody tell me some of the things that the enemy might say to us or even how he might make us feel. Because he doesn't just speak to us. In our, in our ears, he affects our emotions also. Come on, somebody talk to me and tell me what the enemy might say. I wish I could walk back and forth like I can in the church. Somebody talk to me. One of the things that the enemy might say or do or make us feel. Yeah. You're not good enough. You're not good enough. You're not equal to them. They can do it, but you can't. Guilt, he might remind you of the things that you've done. Anybody ever have that? Have that all the time, <laughs> right? Remind you of the things you've done. You're insufficient. You're an you can't, you can't do that. Maybe they can, but you can't. And he says that to everyone, always, always, right? So there's a real battle, a real, real battle. He says he might say fear, by the way, um, is something else that, that couples with, with this, right? You're insufficient. He also may affect the way you feel. So the battle is real, right? What's happening in our mind is real. So there's always this constant, 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 constant two voices. One is always speaking truth. Always. And when God speaks truth, it's, it's not always to big you up. Sometimes he's correcting. Sometimes he's correcting us, right? Sometimes he's holding us accountable because he's a father, Right? And if your parent is always like, oh, you're so sweet, and, and they never, you know, you know, like um, discipline you, then that's, that's not good, right? So God is always lifting us up. But whatever it is, it's always to bless us. He's always building his truth. But the other voice is always tearing us down, always bringing us lies, always telling us the opposite of what um, God has um, said to us. So how we define ourselves will affect, how, will affect how we operate in the world. Does that make sense? It totally will. And it will affect how we operate in the natural realm, and it will affect how we operate in the spirit realm, okay? Because it will affect just the, the, the way you move and the confidence that you move in, okay? We we're singing a song a few, a few minutes ago, I know who I am. How was that? How did that sound? Good? Yeah, <laughs> thank you, David. <laughs> I know who I am, right? I'm walking in power. I'm walking in miracles. 
I know who I am. Brian's looking down and he's like, oh, Carrie, no. <laughs> right? But um, guys, the enemy doesn't want us to know who we are. The enemy does not want us to know who God has called us to be. Okay, so we're, and it's so important, you know, guys, that when we sing songs, we're not just singing songs to entertain each other. We're singing scriptures, right? We're singing God's word, and it's so important for us to get that in. All right, so let's talk about identity for a minute. Define identity for me, someone. Yeah, Sean? We're all humans made in God's image? Yeah? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For identity, like for yourself, like your own personal identity. Anybody? Yeah. I, I have a dictionary definition here, so yeah. Yeah? Okay, I got it. So your identity is basically who you are. You know, it's, um, it's the way you think about yourself. <laughs> it's the way you think about yourself, Right? The way, the way we're viewed by the world is part of our identity. Are there characteristics that are you that define you? The things that make you you, Joseph, is your identity. The things that make you you, Jess, right? The things that make us us. The things that make us different from each other, right? Our character, our personality, our originality, our distinctiveness, you know, our uniqueness. Those are the things that, that make up um, our identity. And listen to me. If you're a believer in Christ, meaning if you've opened up your heart and invited God in, God has told us who we are. He has told us who we are. Okay? But the enemy, like I said, he's also talking. And he does not want us to believe anything God has said. Do you know why? Do you know why? The enemy, the, no, this is written down. But do you know why he doesn't want us to believe what God has said? Because the enemy knows the truth. He knows the truth. And he knows how powerful we are when we know who we are. And that terrifies him. That petrifies him. The one thing he does not want is for a believer in Christ to know that the God of the universe lives inside of us. And the God of the universe empowers us. And that we have power over him does not want us to know that because then we can crush him and annihilate him and he does not want that listen to this as believers until we win this battle with who we really are it will be difficult to operate in the authority that God has given us it will be it will be impossible for us to live as children of God so a few weeks ago, we were looking at um, a few uh, people, individuals in the main, in the big church. We looked at, um, in small groups discussions, um, uh, 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 we looked at these people and how, um, uh, we looked at Todd White. You guys remember that? We looked at Todd White. We looked at Rich 99. We looked at Catherine Crick. We looked at these people. And these three people I brought to you guys. Why? Because we've been talking about God empowering us. We've been talking about um, the Spirit of God living with us and wanting to operate through us. And instead of me constantly just saying, you know what? God wants you to lay your hands on the sick. God wants you to drive demons out of people. I thought, well, let me bring you examples of people who are doing that. So that's what we did a few weeks ago, right? So I'm just going to review for those that weren't here and even just for the purposes of today. So these three people, Todd White, Rich 99, Catherine Crick, there were so many. Um, um, they, they have kind of won this battle with their identity. Now listen, the fight against who we are never stops. Even for them, it never, ever stops. But they have learned how to quiet the enemy. They have learned how to quiet that other voice because they know who they are. Okay? And listen, when, when a person um, um, understands who they are, understands the authority that's within them, and that they really are a child of God, and how loved they are by God, it shows on them. It totally, they demonstrate it in their lives, and these people do that. They know that they're God's kids. They know that they're authorized by the God of the universe. They know, King David, no, this is written down, but King David, King David, not David, David, but uh, King David, he knew who he 
was. He knew. He, when he showed up, right, and there are all these, um, there's Goliath, you know, big 10-foot dude, and these soldiers, and they're like, oh, and they're cowering. David's like, what the heck's going on? Don't you guys know who, live in, who lives inside of you? Have you no idea? He goes, what, what, what's going to happen to the man who takes that, that, that giant down? David stepped up. David didn't run from Goliath. He ran towards him with confidence and with power. And that's how God wants us to operate. Because David knew his God. David knew his God. He totally knew his God. Okay, so quick reminder of these three. Todd White, can you pop his picture up for me? Todd White was an atheist. I love um, these guys. And one of the reasons I love these two first guys is <laughs> because they were not, anyways, let me just, sorry, 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 I get excited. Let me just tell you who they are. Todd White was an atheist. He was a drug addict, drug dealer, hated Christians because he thought they were all hypocritical, and I kind of get that because there's a whole lot of that in the church, unfortunately. Um, and then he encountered Jesus. He encountered Jesus, right? Um, I, I, I don't want to get into all his testimony, but he encountered Jesus. He knew, he learned who Jesus was in him, and now he travels the world and he preaches the gospel. He lays his hands on the sick. People get healed. He's an evangelist now, right? He's an evangelist. He has a university called Lifestyle Christianity. I think he's wearing the T-shirt there. And he's identified as a, as a son of God, and he operates from a place of love, and that's all God wants us to do. Rich 99... <laughs> I like this guy so much. He's now um, a, a, a rap artist. He, he was a warlock. He was a sorcerer. He was totally in witchcraft, like really bad. In fact, I found another video um, that I was looking for that really described his testimony. It was 12 minutes long. It was a little long to show. But he was a Satan worshiper. He was involved in Santeria, which is really bad. He was a drug lord. He traveled all over the world selling drugs. And he encountered Jesus. He encountered Jesus. So now he's a pastor. He runs a music label. God told him to open a music label. It's called Bema Music. And he drives out demons and crushes them under, under his feet. It's amazing to see. And then there's Catherine Crick, who I just love. I love her so much. Guys, look these people up. Look these people. Catherine Crick is just awesome. She... Um, it's like many of us, you know, she, she wasn't a Satanist or anything like that. By the way, and this might sound a little odd, like before I talk about Catherine, one of the things I love um, to do as a believer in Christ is to listen to people who are now believers in Jesus who were Satanists. Do you know why? Because they're very familiar with the dark side, and now they've gone from darkness to light. You understand what I'm saying? And they, they, then they teach us about the enemy. They teach us about he operates because, guys, the enemy is very, very real. Okay? He's very, very real. Anyway, so Catherine Crick is like many of us. She, she was a girl. Well, maybe I should say like myself. No, like many of us. She, um, she went to church weekly, um, but she didn't, uh, she didn't know her identity. Maybe I should speak about myself because that was me. I went to church weekly. But at the end of the service, it's like I could have said, bye, Jesus, see you next week, you know? Because my Christianity was like two and a half hours a week. It was like we hung out for two and a half hours a week on Sunday, and it was like, see you later, see you next week, until, you know, the brain surgery, right? The whole story. That, that part, that's my testimony. Where I met Jesus. But she went to church weekly, and she didn't know her identity. She, know, she knew she didn't know who she was in Christ. She didn't know none of that. She lived as a lukewarm Christian. I was so lukewarm, it was terrible. Like, really, really, really. I was ashamed of the gospel, which is, like, really, really bad, right? So she was not fully committed at all. And then God, she, she was a musician and all of that, went to California, and as she got to California, thinking she's going to, you know, start singing and sharing the gospel that, or singing, music career, sorry. And then God called her to be an apostle through a prophet. And so she was, she, she okay, let me say this. I, I, I don't enjoy um, being up here. I much would prefer sitting down there because um, it, it just doesn't come naturally, personally, to me. You know, and she has described that about herself as well. For four years, she preached the gospel to about 10 to 12 people every day. And God gave her a word. Revival has come. 
And sometimes only two people would show up. It would be her, her music leader, and two people. And she'd be saying, revival has come. And you know what happened to her ministry? It's amazing. This January 2021, she turned 30. And all of a sudden, her, her, God opened the door and her, her ministry just exploded. And now she travels all over the United States preaching the gospel. And listen, you guys remember seeing her on the, on the screen? When demons come upon her, oh boy, she knows who she is. She totally knows. She drives them out. And now she travels all over the world. And listen, one of the people we didn't discuss last week, but we're going to big up tonight, is Matthew Wilson. <laughs> Matthew's like, what, 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 oh my, oh my. <laughs> and the reason I said that, the reason I said that is because there's a woman that's now in our church, and she was operating the cameras um, last Sunday, and her name is Andy. I know she wouldn't mind me saying her name, because the church has actually done a video on her when they interviewed her and Matt. She now attends her church, but a couple of, probably about six weeks ago, maybe two months ago in the summer, she was a woman that was in a park, she was living in the park, but she would go to this park close to where Matt lives, and she was, like, doing all kinds of satanic stuff, tarot card reading, and I don't know, all kinds of stuff, not of God, right? And then the Holy Spirit let, led Matt to go up to her, speak to her. He did a deliverance upon her, and now she comes to church. She's been coming to church every week, learning that she's a daughter of the king learning who she is in Christ. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yay, Matthew. Matthew's back there going, seriously, Carrie? Really? Really? <laughs> really? All right. Guys, we will never, ever, we will never, ever, ever walk in our authority if we don't know our true identity, which is what God calls us to be. Okay? Now, I haven't mentioned any scriptures yet. Never listen to a pastor who just tells you their opinion. Okay? Never do that. We're going to look at some scriptures now. John 1, 12 to 13, tells us that. Is it all, awesome, awesome, it's there. But to all, okay, we're going to look at some scripture that, we're, we're, what God says about us, okay, what God says about us. But to all who believed in him, we're talking about us as the children of God. But to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn. So we're reborn. Not a physical, um, um, you know, two people coming together. No, no, no. Resulting from human passion? No. But a birth that comes from God totally and completely supernatural. Okay? 1 John 3, 1 says this. See how, the ver see how much our Father loves us. See how very much our Father loves us. For he calls us his children. And that is what we are. Oops, Matt, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you to shorten it. That is what we are. We're children of God. Romans 8, 14 says, all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Everybody who is led by the Spirit, like Matthew was led by the Spirit of God that day. He, he, he saw her when he recounts the story. He saw her, and God said, come on, over there. And he's like, and uh, <laughs> he actually walked, <laughs> I'm sorry, he walked the other way. He was like, oh, been there. He walked, and then God just, uh, so then he kind of went right back around to her and then, um, and then led her to the Lord and, and delivered her of all kinds, and now she's in the kingdom of God. And here's one. This is one of my favorite verses. It's Romans 8, 19, and it's so incredibly powerful. People out, people out, outside in the world who don't know God, who don't know that Jesus is the answer, they're in need. People need healing. People need deliverance. People need salvation. Because hell, guys, is not just a bad word. It really isn't. It, it isn't. It's a real place, right? It's a real place. Here's Romans 8, 19. For all creation, that's everyone, is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal whose children are, his, who his children really are. Who his children who are empowered by him really are, right? People are waiting for that. There's a real battle for our identity. A real battle. And until we leave this world, it will never stop. You know the people that are constantly calling your house, offering you duck cleaning or to do your windows? And you know how they never stop? The enemy is like that. Like, <laughs> He just keeps coming at us. He never, ever stops. Did Jesus know who he was? 
let's see. Did Jesus know who he was? Let's open this up. Matthew 16, 30, 13 to 17. Let's look at that. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, I love that word, Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, he was just, you know, hanging out. He's like, so pe- what are people saying about me, you know? Who do people say that the Son of Man is? What are they saying about me? And they said, some said you're John the Baptist, right? Some said you're Elijah. And others said that you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then Jesus is like, all right, cool. But who, who do you say that I am? What, what do you, what do you, because he's talking to his disciples. He's just hanging out with them. He's like, what do you, who do you guys think I am? Who, what do you guys say about me? And um, Peter replied, he said, you're, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him and said, you got it, Peter. You got it. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, which is Peter, right? For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Jesus knew exactly who he is. Jesus knew that he was the son of God. And guess what, guys? So are you. Jesus knew he was the son of God, and so are we. We have been adopted as God's kids, fully and completely adopted as God. That's what Ephesians 1, 5 says, that we've been fully adopted, totally and completely adopted. Put that verse up for me. Ephesians 1, 5 says that God, listen to this, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. God has decided in advance to adopt us into his own family in advance to adopt us in his own family, by bringing us onto himself through Jesus Christ. That is what he wanted to do, and, he, and it gave him great pleasure. It's amazing. It's so amazing. Ask your neighbor. Turn to your neighbor and say, who are you? Neighbor. <laughs> neighbor, say, I am a child of God. <laughs> You're fine, you're fine. Guys, there's a war going on, and it's a real battle for our identity, right? The enemy wants us to be like him, lost, lost, not confused, terrified, scared, afraid. He wants us to be like him, and God said no. He said no. He said no. So who is fighting us? Who is fighting us? Who is fighting this identity that we have? It's the spirit. And it is called the spirit of slavery. What, Carrie? The spirit of slavery? How does that work? The spirit of slavery? It's called the spirit of slavery. And this is not me. Again, scripture is there. So, Carrie, are you talking about, when you say slavery, are you talking about like when black people, you know, were taken from Africa and all kind of people were enslaved back in the day? No, I'm not talking about that. Are you talking about when the Israelites were held in slavery by um, um, dude's name, <laughs> Egypt, <laughs> sorry, Pharaoh in Egypt, and then Moses showed, showed up, right, with the power of God, opened the Red Sea, and then walked through. No, I'm not talking about any of that. I'm not talking about slavery in the natural in any way. I'm talking about a spirit. And there really is a spirit of slavery that makes us operate not as God has called us to be. It wants us to operate as the very opposite, as orphans without a father. Not as a son or a daughter who is a ch- who's the child of God, but as an orphan. Let me explain. You know that Bethel song? Marley's going to sing this for us. You guys are going to sing this for us a little bit later. I asked her earlier. You know that Bethel song? Um, okay, I'm going to sing it. Um, I'm no longer. Naomi, can you sing it? <laughs> I'm no longer a slave to fear. You guys know the song, right? I am a child of God. Right, right, right. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Remember, you guys know the song, right? It's not just a song. It's scripture. I am a child of God. Romans 8.15 tells us this. It's so powerful. This is, this is what I'm talking about when I said a spirit of slavery. Romans 8.15 says, so you have not received a spirit. A spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you receive God's spirit. Who's the Holy Spirit, right? When he adopted you as his own children. We have been adopted into the family of God spiritually. Okay? Now we call him Abba Father. Anybody know what Abba Father means? 
mighty God. <laughs> Abba is a word that Jewish children call their dad, daddy. They call their dad, daddy. Listen to this. All of us. All of us used to be slaves to the enemy before. We were held captive by him, literally, literally. Ephesians 2.2 2 tells us that we used to live in sin. Like, remember, before, before you gave your heart, and it's not that we don't sin. Anybody here not sin at all, ever? Of course, right? But, but we're saints, right? But be this is before you invited Jesus in your heart. We used to live in sin, Ephesians 2, thank you. We used to live in sin just like the rest of the world. Obeying the devil, obeying the enemy, right? The commander of the powers in the unseen realm. He is the spirit that works in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Those that are refusing completely like God, he doesn't exist. The enemy doesn't exist. Hell's not real. Heaven, what is that? The, there, there's a spirit that is causing people. There, he's blinded the eyes and he's causing people to believe that. So we used to obey him. So I'm going to call him our former boss before we knew God. Our former leader. He's persistent and he will not stop. He will not call, stop calling us up, whispering to us, reminding us of the things that we used to do. There's another voice. There's a voice of God who speaks to us when we read the word, when we hear. But there's another voice and it's very, very, very accusing. There's a battle for our identity. I'm almost finished. I'm almost finished. All right, so almost finished. So living as sons and living as daughters or living as slaves, okay? Sons and daughters can be identified by one thing. They're very easily identified, the sons and daughters of God. Do you know why? They know they're loved by God. They know that. And when they go through trials, they don't go, oh, God. <gasps> like, they, they know, like, trials suck, okay? They do. They totally do. But when they go through a trial, they know that God is good. And they know, they, 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 they don't question. They keep on believing. You know, they know that trials will come. And they operate from a place of um, like an overcoming and a confident spirit. A spirit that is confident in the God that they serve. Where, where a spirit of slavery is the absolute opposite. As soon as trials come against them, they, 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 they question God's love for them. Does God have to prove his love for us? I think he did that when he sent Jesus. God, God emptied heaven for us. Sin has a price, and Jesus paid it for us on the cross. That's what God did. That's how he showed his love to us. Right? So God doesn't have to show. He doesn't have to. No, oh, my gosh. He's done it all. And he did it before we were born. Like, he did it all. But, but the spirit of slavery, mm -mm. it's constantly questioning God. Is God really going to provide for me? God owns it all. Is God really going to protect me? Does he really love me? The spirit of slavery does that. Another thing the spirit of slavery does, it, it, it affects and totally attacks our self-image. It totally attacks our self-worth. It totally attacks our mind. What do I mean by that? Um, so... If, 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 you, if you just got a job, for example, right, or, you, or you're going to school or you're doing something like that, it's, it's not going to um, let you lose the job, the spirit of slavery, but it will make you feel that you can't do the job. It will make you feel um, incompetent, unable. And the spirit of slavery does not operate alone, by the way. It has friends. Fear intimidation, all of those things are the friends of, 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 of this spirit. And it comes against us. And it stops us from stepping out. It totally and completely stops us from stepping out. It makes us feel inferior, unworthy. It attacks our mind, completely attacks our mind. Anybody ever have that happen to them? I just, I just have both hands up. Because I've been so attacked, it's, it's just, it's even today, even today, like, oh, my gosh. <sighs> you know, even today, just, just, just doing this, like, <sighs> even today, even today, no one's going to listen. They're not going to understand. Like, just do, 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 do. Constant, constant. You're unqualified. You're inadequate. You know what? The thing is, <laughs> Oh, 
God. I am totally unqualified to be a pastor. Really. You know, and, 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 and I say that because I am so, because of that, I am so dependent on the Holy Spirit. I am so dependent on him because I, I, I don't want to be up here. And I'm not saying I, I, I okay, don't take this wrong. <laughs> you guys understand what I'm saying. I'd rather be sitting down there. Like, do you understand what I'm saying? You understand? <laughs> Kate is back there shaking his head. No. I'm just saying, I'm not, I, 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 I don't feel totally qualified to do this. But God has called me to it. And so I do it empowered by him, is what I'm trying to say. I can't do this by myself. I, I, I don't know how to write up a, 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 a preach by myself. I don't know how to do that, is what I'm trying to say. And I, I was going <laughs> to, this is how bad it is. You know, when I, when I got into the University of Toronto back in 18, okay, 18. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Let me take a drink. <laughs> wow, Carrie, you look really good. Um, <laughs> back in 86, when I got into the University of Toronto, listen to this. I was so, um, um, I was so afraid. So they let me in, right? And I was so afraid when they let me in. I thought, did they make a mistake? Like, you know, and it's not that my marks were so bad, but I, I just had a feeling inside of me of not being worthy, of being unqu unqualified. I had that. And, you know, I remember, and this is, none of this is here, but I remember I had a, um, I had a, <laughs> my English, I took English, and there was this professor I had, this English professor, and he, actually a really nice man I learned later but he used to be like a mathematician and now he's an English professor so he's like brilliant like at levels I don't even know what to say and I was doing so poorly it, it was my first year I was doing so poorly and he would write me a note after he saw my D or C or whatever and he would say please come and see me and I was like I was terrified and I'd see him on campus and I'd be like this you know awful. And then in class, we were studying a book, Plato's Republic, I think, or something like that. And uh, I remember sitting in the class, you know, in the university and thinking, is everybody else reading this? Because <laughs> he'd be asking questions and people are putting up their hand. And I'm thinking, am I reading the same book? Like, <laughs> what's going on? How come I don't get any of what's going on in this class, you know? Anyways, I never did go to see him. Um, eventually, you know, passed. Uh, yeah, anyways, uh, yeah. But I, I, I felt very inadequate there at first, the first couple of years. To be honest, I did. And then I learned that, you know, you don't have to struggle. You don't have to get these marks. Just apply yourself. <laughs> apply yourself. In, in high school, I guess it just came easy, so I, I didn't learn that skill. So you just literally apply yourself. Do, put the time in, and the marks will come. It's like weights. Lift the weights, do it consistently, and, and the strength will come, right? The strength will come. So um, what's self-image? Anyways, what's self-image? And this is something that um, um, that spirit attacks. This is self-image. Self-image. Self-image is, is the picture you have of yourself. The picture that we have of ourself that's in our mind, right? I'm almost done. That's in our mind. The, what, the how we feel about ourselves. Not what everybody sees, but it's how we feel about ourselves, right? Anybody here ever feel like totally and completely inadequate, right? Oh, my gosh, have I ever. All right, almost done. Let's look at four. These are really, really quick, really, really quick. To defeat the spirit of slavery. Let's really, really quickly look at four ways to overcome the spirit of slavery, okay, and win the battle. We must, the first thing is we must realize that there's a battle. You, we can't win something if we, if we, if we, right? We must realize that there's a battle. There's a scripture in Hosea 4 or 6, and it says, my people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. We must realize that there's something coming against us. The second thing is we must be, listen to this, we must be fully persuaded with who we are. I know absolutely that I'm a girl. 
that I'm a woman, that I'm female, that I'm Canadian, you know, that I'm a black Canadian. I know that absolutely, right? I'm fully, I'm fully and completely persuaded of that. We must be fully persuaded of who God says we are. That makes sense? We must be fully, com- because listen to this, listen to this. The reason that I'm saying that is when you step outside and God has asked us to lay our hands on the sick and command healing, that spirit that talks to us is going to say to you, who do you think you are? You think that you can lay your hands on the sick? Do you understand what I'm saying? He's going to think, who do you think you are? Remember what you did last week? Remember what you did? Like that spirit is going to talk to you. He's going to talk to you. What if nothing happens when you pray for that person? What if not, you you understand what I'm saying? It totally and completely talks to us that way. Here's a, we have three things. We got two more and then we're all, then we're done. He, he, um, he attacks the way we think about ourselves. He operates in our mind, right? And this is what I'm saying by that. I I don't want to be confusing. We can decorate ourselves with fancy clothes. You know, make sure our eyebrows are popping, great shoes, great boots, great jacket, fancy bag, and look really, really, really great on the outside. But inside, we're, 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 we're crushed. Inside, we're feeling inferior. Right? And that enemy comes against us in that way. Completely demolishes who we are on the inside. And that's the spirit of slavery. Because God builds us up, and that enemy tears us down completely and completely tears us down. It's thoughts of negativity. People can be uh, lifting you up, complimenting you based on what they see, but you know, you're the only one that knows really what's happening inside. I've been there, guys. I've been there so much. I've been there so much. And the last thing is, the last thing is, guys, we have to fill ourselves with truth. I love this game that Joshua has started to do. You know, we have Bibles. We had a ton of Bibles. Because we moved out of here, we moved them. We've got to find them. We've got to fill ourselves with truth so that when the lie shows up, we know the lie. If we don't know the truth, if we don't know what God has said about us. When I was sick on my bed 11 years ago, unable to stand, sit, function, I had no idea that I was a child of God, which is so terrible to say. I had no idea I had a right to healing. I had no idea about any of those things. We need to know the word. We've got to crack it open. The word of God. This is such a great scripture. Psalms 119, 130. I didn't give it to you guys. The entrance of his word brings light. It turns the light on. When the light goes on, we can see. The entrance of his word brings light. You know, last night in the Thursday Zoom call, Mike Todd made a comment, and I'm really almost done. Mike Todd made a comment, and it's so, it's so good. We're doing, we're doing crazy faith right now. He said this, and it hit me. And it's true. Listen to this. It's amazing. This is what he said. It's amazing. It's absolutely crazy and amazing how illiterate Christians are. Illiterate Christians are about the one book that has all the answers for them. It's like, guys, we've been reborn into a new kingdom as children of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? We've been reborn by the Spirit of God. And in this kingdom of God, there are rules and there are regulations and there's all kinds of things. And you're only going to find it in the book. You're only going to find it in the book, right? The guys, the Bible tells us who we are. The Bible tells us about our enemy. Guys, we have an enemy, right? And it helps us how to fight, how to fight the fight of faith. And it helps us to win the battle for our identity. Okay, it helps us to win the battle for our identity. So we're done here. I'm just going to call the um, band back up. Where'd they go? Yeah, if you guys can just sing that song for us. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. And you know what? We're going to do this as well. You know what? Just before you start, I just want to pray. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, we praise you tonight, and we thank you, Lord, that we are your children. We are your kids. You're our Abba Father. You're our Daddy God. We're so grateful to you, Jesus. We're so grateful. 
We're so, so grateful. And Lord, I, I, I myself have been in a place where I felt inadequate. Lord, I, I, I felt completely unable and, and just with that, with that spirit, just co- with the enemy coming against who I am inside, even though you have told me who I was because I didn't read the word, I didn't know. I had no idea. I didn't know. So tonight we're going to jointly, if you want to join me, just raise your hand. We're just going to jointly come against that spirit. Okay, God has given us authority over the spirit realm, over all the powers of the enemy. Not some, not a little, but some, but all, sorry, all the, and nothing shall by any means hurt us. Nothing. So if you've ever felt, you know, um, unable, inadequate, any of those things, just with that, with that uh, uh, spirit coming against your heart and who you are, just pray with me. Just pray with me. Jesus, we thank you and we praise you. We come against that spirit right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father God, that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. And every tongue, even if somebody has said something about you in the past, every tongue rising up against you, we say no to you and we crush you right now in Jesus' name. Spirit of slavery, spirit of fear, spirit of intimidation coming against anyone here. We say no to you right now in Jesus' name. We say no to you right now in Jesus' name. We bind you and we say no to you in Jesus' name. And Lord, we just welcome in, Lord, your spirit of peace, your spirit of grace, your spirit of hope. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And courage, Holy Spirit. Courage. Thank you, Lord, for anyone here that's in school or, Lord Jesus, or working, Lord. Just be, be, be our, our, our ability, Lord. Be our ability. Help us, Lord, to be strong. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be strong. And, Lord, I thank you for protecting everybody here against COVID in Jesus' name. Lord, we know that you're not just up here going, oh, what am I going to do about this COVID thing? No, Lord, we know. We're loved by you, protected by you, guided by you, and provided by you, Jesus. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord.